Welcome back tonight at our Bible study as we study God's Word uh, in Luke chapter 14. You'll be finding your place there. I also have a another prayer that I want to read to you from the Valley of Vision as we look into uh, the subject of discipleship. Discipleship. Again, at the end of our service, we will... Uh, to pray through our prayer concerns that people will be uploading. Luke chapter 14. We'll begin to read in verse 25. But first I want to read to you a prayer from the Valley of Vision. The God of my end... Thou hast given me a fixed disposition to go forth and spend my life for Thee. If it be the will, let me proceed in it. If not, then revoke my intentions. And I want, all I want in life is such circumstances as may best enable me to serve Thee in the world. To this end, I leave all of my concerns in thy hand. But let me not be discouraged, for this hinders my spiritual fervency. Enable me to undertake some task for thee, for this refreshes and animates my soul, so that I could endure all hardship and labors and willingly suffer for thy name. But oh, what a death it is to strive and labor, to be always in a hurry and yet do nothing. Alias, time flies and I am of little use. Oh, that I could be a flame of fire in thy service, always burning out in one continual blaze. Fit me for singular usefulness in this world. Fit me to exult and distresses of every kind, if they but promote the advancement of thy kingdom. Fit me to quit all hopes of the world's friendship and give me a deeper sense of my sinfulness. Fit me to accept as just desert from thee any trial that may befall me. Fit me to be totally resigned to the denial of pleasures I desire and to be content to spend my time with thee. Fit me to pray with a sense of the joy of divine communion, to find all times happy seasons to my soul, to see my own nothingness, and wonder that I am allowed to serve thee. Fit me to enter the blessed world where no unclean thing is, and to know thee with me always." What a beautiful prayer of discipleship. Lord, help me to be the disciple that you have called me to be. Though times get tough, and though we are encountered with many different situations in our life, and though many decisions will have to be made, and we'll be faced with many hard decisions as we live our life out for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're called also, as we do so, to continue to test uh, the faithfulness of discipleship. Are we truly being disciples of Christ? Are we spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we living up to the calling uh, in which Christ has placed on us? Are we excited about what God uh, has done in our past, is doing now, presently, and will do uh, in the future as we continue to push forward for the glory of God and for the good of His people uh, and for the excitement and anticipation of his coming and his kingdom. As we read in Luke chapter 14, if you'll read along with me, beginning in verse 25. Now large, large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and he said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observes it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then... None of you can be my disciples who does not give up all of his possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear let him hear. What strong passages of Scripture that we read uh, in Luke chapter 14, the Gospel of Luke, which essentially is speaking about discipleship, what it means to be a disciple and what it means to consider and to count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus Christ, to be in a relationship with Him and to walk in this walks of life, this earth, this world, which is contrary uh, to the Word of God. It is in many ways wicked and in many ways has different ideologies and most certainly does not hold to the theology of the Christian faith. And what are we to do as children of God, as people that have been set apart, people that have been set, set apart in a relationship with Christ to, to live our lives out in such a way that we are glorifying God and we are helping other people to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that's not always easy. But as we would read Scripture and as Scripture would teach us and as we lean on the inerrant and all-sufficient Word of God, then we come to understand that we are, for lack of better words, fish out of water when it comes to our society and our world and the culture in which we live. We do not talk like them. We should not act like them. We should not value the same things that the world values, love the same things that the world loves. I'm not saying that we're not to be in the world because the Lord has allowed us to stay here, to be image bearers of Him, to glorify His holy name. But we still are to consider the cost and what it means to be a Christ follower. Perhaps some of the difficulties that we will be faced with in this walks of life, all the while understanding and comprehending and valuing the life to come that we will live with Him. There's three things that I want us to see as we look at these passages of Scripture tonight and as we look into the topic, true discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? Well, most certainly, we know what it does not mean. Uh, we know being a disciple of Christ doesn't mean that everything's always going to be perfect and that everything's always going to go exactly the way we 
think or the the way that we want things uh, to work out. That's never been the promise of God. God said he would never leave us nor forsake us, and that's true. God's going to be with us, but God has different things that each of us is going to experience as we walk through life, as we experience life as a believer of In Christ, uh, there's going to be things that we're faced with, things that we're going to have to think through, and things that most certainly God's going to have to help get us through. And as we do that, are we considering the cost? Are we considering what it means to be a disciple of Christ? So the first thing I want us to see is this. A true disciple values Jesus above all others. A true disciple values Jesus above all others. If you look at verse 25 and verse 26, as the large crowds were gathering around and going with him and many people were inquiring about the Lord, many people were seeing the miracles that Jesus was performing and seeing the things that he was able to do, and many people were there as as as, as onlookers to to partake of of only the good things that Jesus uh, can bring them in their life. And I think sometimes, as people of God, we lose our perspective and we lose our understanding. And sometimes we come to Christ and we expect that Jesus bless us with all the good things that we would uh, consider good uh, in this world. And we ask that God bless us and that God would be with us and that God would help us through different situations and different scenarios in our life. And there's, it's not wrong to pray to the Lord. It's not wrong to request that God help us through those things. In fact, I think scripture is very balanced to say we should speak to God. We should pray to God. We should seek God uh, in his leadership and his guidance. But if the only reason we're seeking God is to receive only the fringe benefits of the kingdom of heaven, then I feel like we've missed the main point in what it means to be in love with God and to be a follower of God and to trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I think as Luke records this for us, it becomes evident. It becomes very clear to us as to what Jesus expects of those that are going to truly follow him. Those that are truly dedicated to the gospel. Those that are willing to give anything and everything for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As crowds were were gathering around, as crowds were going along with him, I can imagine, I can only imagine how shocking uh, this teaching that Jesus is teaching them as he's walking with them and as he's teaching them, I can just imagine the shock, the reality check that was present And so many uh, that were in that crowd as they heard these words, anyone that comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Those are shocking words. Those words have a way of bringing one down to reality. To think about just what really is at stake in coming to know Christ and following Him. It's just as Jesus said. Now, Jesus is not calling people. He's not contradicting himself here. And, 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 and we know as we study the Bible that the Bible is rightly uh, divided. And, and in fact, Jesus is, teaches us in other places of the Bible, the, uh, some of the other gospels that we are to uh, value life. We are to love our neighbor uh, as ourself. We're to minister to one another. We're to care about one another. We're most certainly to honor our father and our mother. We're to love our brothers and our sisters and, and, and to be there for one another. So Jesus is not saying, hey, I want you to hate people. But most certainly 
it rings true that we are to value Jesus above all else. Uh, that Jesus, the concept there is that sometimes we get things out of perspective as, as disciples and as followers of Jesus and we sometimes push Jesus, not that Jesus can be pushed uh, because he is sovereign Lord, but sometimes in our own life, in our own chaotic lives as we're living, we sometimes push Jesus, if you want to use this terminology, to the back burner and we put everything else in life before him. So there's this concept here. There's this truth here that, that seated deep into a person's heart by the power of the Holy Spirit coming to know the gospel and not only just it being a head knowledge, but also a heart knowledge where it creates in us a, a desire to repent, to turn away from who we are and what we've been, to turn to Christ and, and to value Him and to love Him above all things. And I believe that that is what is true of being a disciple of Jesus. Not a literal hate of other people, not a literal hate of father and mother or, or, or of wife and of, of children and brothers and sisters. Uh, and Jesus even says here of your own life. In other words, to be a disciple of Christ, a true disciple of Christ means that that person, that individual that is placing faith in Jesus values their relationship with Christ and their walk with him above all else in life. It's to put Jesus First, it's, to, it's, it's our, our decisions that we make on a daily basis. It's our, our devotion time. It's our understanding and reading of Scripture. It's our holding one another accountable. Whatever it might be that we are putting Jesus first in everything that we do. Well, sure, that's a test when it comes to discipleship. Because that's also a struggle as we have all kinds of temptations that come our way. But God is faithful. And to be a true disciple, it means that we must value Christ in our relationship to Him. It's more than just a mere profession of faith. It's more than just a card that we sign. It's more than just walking down an aisle. It's more than just repeating uh, some kind of formulated uh, prayer. Uh, it is about having a relationship with Christ and valuing our relationship with Him above all else. That's one thing that we see here as we test our discipleship. Are we disciples of Christ? But there's another thing. Number two, a true disciple is willing to bear cross for a season in order to enjoy Jesus eternally. A true disciple is, is willing to bear a cross for a season in order to enjoy Jesus eternally. Look at verse 27 there. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's interesting and most certainly to be a Christian is not always a bed of roses. You've heard me mention that before and in, 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 in conversation with other people uh, talk about that because sometimes we have a a messed up view of what it means to be a follower of Christ. We, again, we, we lean heavily sometimes on the benefits that we receive from being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's not wrong. I'm not saying that, that, that you know, there's not benefits to being a child of God, but that's not, that's not why we become a child of God so that way we can receive all of these fringe benefits. That's like joining a country club. Uh, just to be able to enjoy all the perks that come along with being a country club member. And I would argue that if we didn't get all those perks as we pay so much money to be members of country clubs that we probably would not be members of country clubs. So we have to put things in its right perspective and understand what Jesus is talking about. You know, to be a Christian is to bear a cross. 
uh, I, I would say often. Uh, to be a Christian does not mean that everything's always going to work out just as we've planned or as we would like for things uh, to work out. In fact, you look into Scripture and you see the life of the disciples, all but John, uh, died a martyr's death. Uh, many people lost their lives because of the gospel. A true disciple of Christ must be willing to bear a cross. That cross might be different uh, for each of us. Our difficulties might be different in different situations. But we're called as believers to bear that cross just as Jesus bore the cross, just as He lovingly came to this earth, emptied Himself, became a bondservant and died under the wrath of His Father. I would say that He bore the cross well, victoriously, that He could ransom many. So to be a true disciple, we must be willing to bear a cross even for a season in order to enjoy Jesus eternally. You know, there's going to be benefits to the kingdom of God. There are benefits to being a believer in Jesus, but let's not lose sight of the goal. The goal in life is to glorify God. The goal in eternity is to glorify God. It's not about, per se, dancing in the kingdom. It's not about walking the streets of gold. It's not about all of the beautiful, miraculous, wonderful things that we're going to be able to encounter and be able to experience and be able to witness. Though those things, though those things are important and though those things are going to be wonderful and though God wants us to enjoy those things because he's redeeming us and giving us those benefits, that is not the primary goal. The primary goal is to enjoy Christ forever, to glorify Him. So if we have to be willing as disciples to bear a cross, to go through persecution and difficulties and hardships and things of that nature, then we can do that for a season in order that we might enjoy Jesus eternally. That's the goal. And that's what it means to be a disciple. And we must continuously examine that even in our own lives. But not just that. There's a third thing. A true disciple considers the cost of being a follower of Jesus. A true disciple considers the cost of being a follower of Jesus. Look at verse 28 and following. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? It's another great example that Luke records Jesus teaching. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000 men? That's, that's a lot different. You have a king coming to battle with you and he has 20,000 men and you only have 10,000 men? He has a lot more than you have. Did you consider that? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Did you consider that? So then, None of you can be my disciples who does not give up all of his own possessions. 
That's shocking. And it shocks us into reality, but that's exactly what we need to happen. We expect the Holy Spirit to deal with those that belong to Him. To deal with us, to shock us into reality, to, to constantly bring to our remembrance what Christ has done for us and to help us to constantly and continuously consider the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. To understand that we must value Jesus above everything. To understand that we must be willing uh, to bear a cross and, and to consider what that's going to cost us as we live this life for God's glory. I don't know about you, but being in the ministry for quite some time now, I've seen many people make professions of faith. Many people experience somewhat of an emotional experience in their life. Something traumatic perhaps has happened or, or something's going on in their life and they think, well, coming to Jesus will be a quick fix to that. And that's not, that's not always the case. Uh, in fact, we we always have to work through and 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 think through and and make good godly decisions, even as a as as a Christian, as someone that is 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 saved. But I see so many people uh, go through emotional experiences for whatever reason that, that they're faced with, make that decision to follow Jesus, uh, and yet down the road, when things seem to get better. Uh, they walk away from the church. They walk away from their walk with Christ. And oftentimes we as Baptists, we don't want to admit any kind of fault. So we say, well, they're just in backslidden conditions. They're just out there. And we're not, we're not saying that people can't fall off into sin. I'm not saying that true believers can't sin because they can uh, I've struggled with sin each and every day of my life, and but I pray that, that God's Spirit continues to to push me and to probe me and help me to to examine myself. And I pray to God I never uh, turn away from His grace and His mercy uh, in the gospel, which is His power unto salvation. Uh, but you have people that leave the faith; they walk away from it. They they hear the good news, and 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 for a while it seems to be the real deal. They. they they're excited. They're on fire. They want to know more about it. But then when things seem to be going well, or maybe perhaps temptation comes or testing uh, is on them, then they wash their hands of that, walk away, and on to the next thing that they think's best. Well, you have to ask yourself, in situations like that, did they consider the cost of what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus? I believe in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and I believe in the inspired Word of God and I most certainly believe in the sufficiency thereof that, that God's Word applies to all of life. Not just in first century Palestine but also in 21st century uh, Arley, Alabama. That God's Word is relevant. We don't make it relevant, it is relevant. And it applies to not only a first century but a 21st century and I believe that what Luke has recorded Jesus teaching uh, still applies to us today do we consider the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Christ do we consider the fact that following Jesus is not always going to be easy uh, in fact that we find ourselves even now in a in a uh, worldwide pandemic and and the good news is is Christ is still on his throne the good news is, is that God is still sovereign. And the good news is that God is working even through this pandemic uh, to bring about his purpose. And that is to glorify his holy name. Now, can, do I have all the answers to that? Absolutely not. Don't even uh, begin to try to answer all of those questions. But it's the deep-seated trust that we should be having as disciples of Christ uh, in the gospel to know that death can't separate us from God uh, Perel can't separate us from God. Wickedness is not going to separate us from God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But did we consider uh, as we were looking into God's holy word what it means to truly be disciples? Now, I don't mean to paint a grim picture of being a follower of Jesus because being a follower of Jesus is a glorious thing. 
It's a great thing. It's an encouraging thing. But I want us, especially members of MBC, people that are associated with Meek Baptist Church, I want us to have a healthy understanding of our Christian faith. And I want us to have a healthy understanding of what it means to be disciples of Christ. And I want us to get that pie-in-the-sky, fluffy, feel-good, prosperity gospel out of our minds and understand that being a disciple of Jesus is one of the best things. It is the best thing that you will ever encounter is having that relationship with Christ, having been justified, forgiven of your sins, walking in sanctification where Jesus is, is, is making you uh, into what he wants you to be. He's molding you and preparing you uh, for the consummation of his kingdom that we're going to, yes, spend eternity with him. But at the same time, I want us to constantly be able to remind ourselves to consider the cost of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Verse 28 is just really clear in how Jesus is teaching and Luke recorded for us that who does this? Wants to build a tower and does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. It's self-explanatory, really, as you, as you read it. You, you, you get the conclusion of what's going to happen, uh, the ending, uh, if you do not have the funds or the resources or the means to be able to complete what you started. Well, that happens so often in, in, in people's profession of faith. It's, it's, yes, I want Jesus and I want all the good things that he has to offer, but I'm not willing uh, to walk through this life and perhaps be persecuted. I'm not willing to walk through this life and perhaps have to bear a cross. And I most certainly am not willing to put Jesus before my, my family, my mother, my, my, my father, my brothers, my sisters, my wives, my kids. You, I'm not willing to do that. Well, if you're not willing to do that, then have you considered uh, really what discipleship is all about? especially when people will look at you. You see verse 29, otherwise when he has laid a foundation, he started this building, he started this tower and he's not able to finish it. All who observe it will begin to do what? They'll begin to ridicule you because you were not able to finish what you started. Well, we know that Jesus is teaching us and giving us an example really of discipleship how that looks. Now that doesn't change Jesus. That doesn't change God. That doesn't remove God from his throne. That, it doesn't change him at all. In fact, God's unchangeable. But to have somebody to profess faith in Christ and yet a couple years down the road not want anything to do with Christ, not want anything to do with his word or his church, then that brings reproach on the people of God. And I've heard too many people say before, I have no interest in a God that really can't change people, in a God that can't change people's lives. You say God is powerful. You say God is in the saving business. But I have so many people that, 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 that prof I've heard of so many people that profess faith and yet they do not live changed lives. Well, you have to conclude here where Jesus does is that they didn't consider the cost and perhaps they might not be true disciples of the Lord same thing in verse 31 is he's talking about a king that's going out to war I, I would hope that most people would consider uh, the consequences of that especially if you're taking uh, less men out to fight that battle uh, against a king that has way more men than you do, then the odds are probably not going to be real well uh, for you. Well, you know, the Christian life is to be considered. Discipleship uh, is to be considered, to count the cost, to pray, uh, to be ready uh, always to give a defense of the faith and, 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 and share the gospel and help other people to consider the cost. 
But then verse 34, which I really didn't have in my outline, but I read those verses, it speaks to this as well. You see in verse 34, therefore salt is good, but, it, but it, even salt has become tasteless. Then what, what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or for the mature, um, excuse me, manure pile. Uh, it is to be thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, the conclusion there is, as disciples of Christ, we most certainly do not want to be found useless. We do not want to teach other people that we've made professions of faith and that Jesus is only our God in our mind. Because essentially, at the end of the day, if we've only made a profession and Jesus is only our God in our mind, then we're compared to this salt that's lost its saltiness. It's not good for anything. It's not good for the soul. And he, he uses stronger language to say it's not even good for the manure pile. It doesn't serve a purpose in life. Well, I guess a good question to end on is what is your purpose in life? Do you have a purpose? And is God the driving force behind your purpose? And are you going to be one of those professing disciples only that really you serve no purpose in the kingdom? And might I remind you that the kingdom is already it's already, but not yet. I think that we need to keep that on the forefront of our mind because so often we think of, we just pass through life and we think of kingdom, eschatological, future tense. We think of, oh, one day when we, when we get there, when we get on the other side, we're going to enjoy peace with God. Can I encourage you tonight to say this, that you should be able to enjoy peace with God now. You are a part of God's kingdom now if you've trusted in the gospel, if you've repented of sins, you've turned away from you and trusted in Jesus. You're part of the kingdom now. Yes, there's going to be a future aspect to that kingdom. You're going to be a part of that future eschatological kingdom. But don't wait until then to decide that you're going to do what you need to do to love Jesus, you do that now. You live out your life now as a disciple. In fact, you value Jesus above everything and everyone. You consider what it means to bear that cross and to do so lovingly for the glory of God. And you most certainly consider the cost of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you don't do that just one time in history. You do that every day of your life. And you do so for the glory of God. So as I read in the beginning from one of the Puritans, the Valley of Vision, uh, it was a prayer to, to discipleship. It was asking God to equip us to be able to consider the cost of what it means to walk with Jesus every single day. So at this time... I'm going to close by our, our prayer concerns. I hope and pray that, that you know that you can put those up there. Uh, we have eight unspoken prayer requests at this time. Brenda Taylor, pray for me. Uh, God knows what's going on in her life. Sue Reed, pray, pray for her brother David, which lost his wife. Uh, Rose Blado, pray for my brother, Mr. Shelton, is that right? And then Michelle Lyons, pray for me and Tyler as we go to Children's Hospital tomorrow for an appointment. Those are all very important prayer requests, and we most certainly want to be sensitive and attentive uh, to the needs that people are trusting us with as they put them on 
the comment sections of our live stream Wednesday night Bible study. So we want to remember them. Hey, this is a new way of ministering to us as well. We are hoping and praying that, that before long we can get back together and, and, and corporately meet, however that's going to look in the future. But I can promise you this, is God's going to be with us. However that works out, I can't promise you how it's going to work out because I'm not God. But I do know that God loves His church. I do know that Jesus Christ died for the bride. And I do know this, that if you belong to Jesus Christ, you're a part of that bride. And I can assure you with everything, every fiber of my being, that Jesus loves his church. And he wants his church to meet corporately for worship. So if the Lord tarries and he allows the world to go on, the church will continue to go on too. Let me pray for us. Father, we do bow before you. Father, we're not the best always at considering the cost of what it means to be disciples of Christ. And Father, I didn't teach that tonight to discourage anyone, but hopefully to encourage people. That Father, even the best of the best the greatest theologians in the history of the church and the greatest theologians that live today struggle every day. Father, perhaps there's someone out there tonight that is struggling with why I consider this all the time. Why do I think, why do I think about what it means to follow Jesus. And perhaps they're interpreting that in a way of doubt. But Lord, we should examine ourselves. As Peter tells us, we should examine ourselves to make sure our election and our calling is sure. And Father, those that do that will not stumble. So Father, it is a healthy thing. And we know from your word, it is healthy for us as your children to consider the cost. Lord, help us to value our relationship with you above all else, above our jobs, above our, our relationships, our friendships, Father, our leisure time, our vacations, Lord, even above COVID-19. Lord, we get caught up so often in the media, the negativity, the gossip and the sinfulness of it. And we forget Oftentimes it's you're on your throne and you're caring for your church. And Father, you're working through different means to bring about your purpose and your end. And most importantly, your glory. So Father, as I pray tonight, as there's many herding sheep in the congregation at NBC, Father, that you know the needs. You know how they need to be ministered to. And Father, we want that. We want to minister to them. We pray for Brenda. Uh, Lord, just pray that you would be with her nephew. Lord, the relationship that, that uh, her nephew's in, Lord, you know the details to that and you know how that, Lord, that they need to be ministered to. So I just pray, Lord, lift them up to you and pray that most of all that through this, through this situation that Christ would be exalted and people would be saved. And Father, our sister Sue, Lord, just continue to lift up her brother David. Lord, most of us were aware that, that he lost his wife and it was very sudden and very traumatic to him and to Sue and to Larry and to that family. And so, Father, I just pray that you continue to sustain him with your grace. Father, we don't always have the answers that people are seeking and searching for, but you do. And, Father, we can't always comfort people, but you can. So, Father, I just pray for the Reed family. Pray for David. God, just lift him up to you. And, Lord, Rose, pray for Rose. Pray for her brother. Uh, Lord, you know the situation there. You know what's going on. You know the battles that he's faced with, the sicknesses in his body. And Lord, just...
pray that uh, your healing hand, if it be your will, that you would touch him. Give Rose and Jamie the, the wisdom that they need to minister in the way that they need. And Father, we glorify you for that. And Michelle, Lord, thank you for Michelle and for Gerald. And Lord, for the Lyons family. And Lord, just thank you so much for Tyler. Lord, what a walking testimony. Lord, Michelle and, and, and Gerald both know what it means to bear a cross. Tyler knows what it means to bear a cross. To walk through this life and to, to have a sickness or to be diagnosed with a, with a sickness. And so many of us get up every day and complain and we don't even have a sickness. Father, we're thankful that you've healed him. And Father, that he's continuing to battle. But Lord, what a weight on his young life. What a weight on his mother and his father. Lord, they know all too well what it means to bear a cross. And yet they still love you and they request that you help them. And as they go to the doctor tomorrow, Lord, you give them good report and be with Tyler and keep him healthy. And Lord, protect him from any kind of diseases or, or, or COVID-19. Lord, having to leave home and, and go into facilities that has been exposed. Lord, we just trust that you're going to protect him. And Father, the eight unspoken prayer requests, Lord, you know each and every need. Lord, I pray that you would be with them. They have requested prayer requests. They know who they are. They know what they need, and you do too, Lord. So I pray that you would be with those unspoken prayer requests. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless. I um, want to just kind of remind everybody, as Jared put out a calling post yesterday, or a call multiplier is the technical term, the correct term, uh, to, to anybody that's in our congregation. Um, you know, we feel a heavy burden and responsibility as, as leadership and as a church to minister to you and to your needs. And um, I know the deacons feel the same. But if we don't know, we can't minister. And I know that we probably have people that do not want to get out of the house, and that's fine. We, we respect that. And maybe some of you need groceries or you need... You need something, but you're not going to leave because you want to stay home and, and respect the, the stay-at-home order, or the, at least the safe order now, safe-at-home order. Um, we want to be able to minister to you if we can. Uh, it's not that we purposefully neglect anybody. We don't want to neglect people. Uh, we want to love on everybody that's associated with NBC and, and, and even people in our community that's not. We want to continue to reach people uh, with the gospel, but we have to know there's one thing that we're not, well, there's several things that we're not, but we're not omniscient. We do not read minds and, 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 and know all things as God does. So if you need something... Don't be so prideful not to call us. You're not a burden on us. In fact, we want to serve you. We want to help you. So if we need to take some time out of our day to go pick up you some groceries because you don't want to get out, you don't feel it's safe to get out, then we're willing to do that. Somebody at NBC, Meek Baptist Church, will be willing to do that. Might not even be groceries. Might be something else. We do not want you at home alone not being loved on as we want to love on you. So please remember that. Until next time, your pastor loves you. Keep praying for us, and may God bless.